วันนี้ไม่ตาเป็นนิตอมวันนี้ไม่ตาเป็นนิตอมสัมบัติรีสปอนด์ได้ That means good morning friends of my language วันนี้ไม่ตาเป็น Good morning ดีทัมป์อัน Friends so good morning friends how are you doing today All right Good morning Richard <laughs> My name is Darius Coombs, I'm Mashby Wampanoag, and also have um, Nantucket ties to, to here, right? Um, my people have been around this area in Massachusetts for over 12,000 years, you know, as you heard from the last speaker, right? And we're still here today, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do today is like Wampanoag, right, is a culture of people one out of over a thousand different indigenous cultures going across North America. What makes Wampanoag different from the other thousand? It could be language. Um, that's common to a lot of people too. It could be diet. could be the housing we lived in. But one common bond we all have is how we think about life in general. We respect all forms of life, being human life, plant life, animal life. We don't put ourselves above or below that. That's one thing we have all in common. I do a lot of teaching, right? And I ask the people, what race do we come from? The human race, right? So we should all respect each other. And that's rule of thumb for my, 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 my people, you know? So like I said, we've been here for 12,000 years. That's me up there, my lovely wife, Tootie, who teaches <laughs> language also right next to me, holding the turkey feather mantle. What I'm gonna do, guys, is I'm gonna bring you to a year, 1613 before there was any major interruption in our culture, okay? I'm gonna bring you to our New Year's. You think about our New Year's, right? A lot of people's New Year's starts January 1st, okay? Our New Year starts when everything comes to life. Now think about it, when does everything come to life? Springtime, Springtime right? That's when the birds start chirping. That's when the oak leaf comes out. That's when the herring start to run. That just makes sense, everything's new again. And every year it could be a day or so different. But in our new year, we, we thank Mother Earth. We thank the creator for having another year because it's not guaranteed. And we do a lot of dancing. We do a lot of feasting. We do a lot of socializing. But once that happens, we, we know we have to get to work, right? And these are the types of houses we live in during the summertime, okay? The spring and summer. This is a spring and summer mat covered we too. We live in single family homes during the summer sites because we needed our space for planting. Now these maps, these reeds right here are cattails. Cattail is a water plant. And me being on Plymouth Plantation, same as long as Richard, we've been doing this for years. And everything we do at the museum, right, we do ourselves. So we go and gather the cattail, late August, early September, and we make these mats in the winter for our houses, right? And the mats will last maybe three to five years. Um, they're waterproof. They have a cup to it, so it acts like a natural funnel. And these houses would hold one family. It's different from a European family, right, back then. European family is husband, wife, kids. Our family has husband, wife, kids, aunts, grandparents. You're looking at three or four generations inside one house. And that's one big thing that was different, you know? So we would have Englishmen come into our houses and say, hmm, this guy has five wives. <laughs> maybe, but maybe not. <laughs> but but not, then again, not looking, realizing what they're looking at, possibly. What they're looking at is um, sisters, grandmothers, aunts. So that's what my job is, to look at these primary sources and break it down, what it means for Wampanoag people in indigenous cultures, okay? So those are the houses we live in in the summer. And what we do during the summer now, this is our planting field, right? Everybody loves corn, beans, and squash, right? They call them the three sisters. And who takes care of the fields are the women. The women are considered to be the givers of life, okay? So they also give life to Mother Earth. So you look at the planting field, right? It has a mound, I don't know if you can see the mound, but the women do a mound first of dirt, and that's symbolic to a woman's stomach when she gives life, okay? Now, when do you plant corn? You have to wait for different signs in nature. Okay, once the shad bush starts to bloom, once the herring starts to run, you wait until the next new moon. The reason you do it on the new moon, 
the new moon draws gravity up. So it helps that corn seed grow. So you plant corn, corn takes nitrogen out of the ground, you plant your beans right next to it and the beans will add nitrogen back into the ground and wrap around the stalk of the corn. Okay, what you plant on the bottom, you plant your squashes, your watermelons, your pumpkins, and they have a large leaf and they'll shade the ground to keep the ground soft. Vegetables for us as native people would probably represent anywhere from half to two thirds of the diet. Probably over Nantucket, it's probably less, a lot more seafood, okay? But like I said, Wampanoag culture, it makes up a large part of Massachusetts, okay? Going past Boston, some people say Gloucester. Going far west is Worcester. Going past to Rhode Island, and all the islands, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Penikis, Cuddy Hunk. Let me mention some names to you, right? Because back then we had over 70, well, about 70 Wampanoag communities. Nantucket sound familiar? Syasconset, Mattapoisset, Pocasset, Seekonk, Mashpee, Nauset. These are name places and town names, but they've always been Wampanoag communities. Okay? Um, and at one time we numbered over 100,000, today is about 12,000, and we'll get into that a little later. But. So that's a planting field. And what is next? So we know the moms and the aunts, they take care of the fields. They consider to be the givers of life. What do the kids do during the spring? <laughs> what do the kids do during the spring and summer, Tashima? These are <laughs> Tashima's my daughter right there, guys, one of my daughters. And this is her in this picture when she was 11 years old, maybe 10. And that's her younger sister, Storm, with her. And what she's doing is picking sumac. Um, stag on sumac, you pick those berries, you boil them up, and that right there has three times as much vitamin C as orange juice does. And so kids were allowed to be kids. They helped out a little bit, but they had fun. They played games, they went swimming, they had running races, they joked around. And, what, and a person can go through four or five different names in a lifespan, right? As you would change as a person, your names would change also to fit how you are. Now, you wouldn't take the names yourself, we still have medicine people in our community that gives us names depending on how we are. Now let's, go, let's talk about Tashima. What does that mean? Tashima means one who lifts up, right? It's not because she's physically strong and all that, but Tashima wakes up in a good mood almost every single day. And when she wakes up in a good mood, she raises a house so everybody feels good. So you give a name depending on the person but kids will give them more responsibility as they matured. This is me and my lovely wife, Tootie. We did a lot of fishing back then. Um, still do today, still a big part of the culture. Um, you saw a lot of men going ocean fishing, freshwater fishing. A lot of the women would get the um, shellfish, like clams, mussels, crabs. Now the biggest fish we would go for, I'm not sure if it's found around here, if it ever was here. But my large parts of Wampanoag country, any idea what the biggest fish was that would go in the rivers and ocean back and forth? No, it's 20, 30 foot in length sometimes. Somebody said, I think, sturgeon. Sturgeon. And sturgeon, they're big fish, right? And we go fishing for these um, fish at nighttime in our boats, what we call a machoon. We had our machoon ashes that would range anywhere from a one foot, nine foot, not one, one foot, I should nine foot, one man boat, to boats big enough to carry 40 men. We have three different recordings of Europeans seeing 40 man boats, machine ashes, being sailed out to Nantucket Island. Not paddled, sailed. Which we paddled too, which we pulled along the shore. But when we went for the sturgeon, right, we go out at nighttime, we'd have torches on the end of our boats. The light of the torch will attract the sturgeon up, and they'll flip over on their belly, and we will spare them. A lot of the time, the fish got bigger than the boat, so you couldn't put the fish inside the boat, so you drag it in the shore. Salmon was another fish. We had so much flounder, you walk down the beach at low tide, spare flounder. Cod, they say they're so thick, you can walk right across the backs of the tip of Cape Cod. Okay? Lobster, not a big deal. We use lobster for fishing bait. Times have changed, right? We had so much lobster, 
We got on the beach at low tide and pick them right off the beach. I'm not saying we didn't eat lobster, but it was common. Okay, you go back 100 years ago, and lobster was fed to prisoners in jail up by Boston, right? Every single day. And the prisoners had a big uprising. They said, oh, geez, we're sick of this. We don't want no more. <laughs> so there was a law that was made in Massachusetts that you only could feed lobster to prisoners twice a week. If you did it more than that, it was considered to be inhumane. <laughs> right? Back in 1623, Governor Bradford, right, had a ship come in. He was so embarrassed. He was, I'm very, very sorry. This is all we have is lobster to give you guys. So not a big deal. It takes on different today, different meaning. So we did a lot of fishing during the summer. The men are considered to be the takers of life. Okay? And that's different from the women who give life. So that's why we do the majority of the fishing. Now after harvest time, we think about going inland. We want to go inland a little bit away from the ocean. I know it's hard to do in Nantucket, but <laughs> I'm sure you try to find more shelter around the more woodsy area, in which you get protection from the wind from the ocean. Okay? Inland might be a half mile, maybe a mile. And these are the houses we live in. We've heard the names before, long houses. They're bark-covered houses. And normally during the winter, these houses could be anywhere from 100 foot long to one of the biggest houses we found. On, we found the footprint of this house, right? It probably was a meeting house, but it was a structure like this. This footprint was found out in Worcester. The footprint of this bark-covered house was 300 foot in length and six, 320 foot in length and 60 foot in width. I tell kids, if you don't know what that means, think of a football field. That's how big this house was. The frames were made out of cedar, okay? The outside bark normally would have been ch chestnut and elm. We don't have those trees around here anymore, so we use tulip poplar today. And we used to use white ash, but unfortunately you got the emerald ash bug right now today that's wiping out those trees. Um, and they get warm, we'll talk about that in a minute. The men did the hunting. Like I said, the men are considered to be the takers of life. And we hunt for the deer for big game. Heard there was also so much deer around here at one time. Um, we, on the mainland, we go for black bear, moose, elk also for big game. Small animals, you guys like the taste of skunk? Anybody? That's a good answer, right? They never tried it, right? <laughs> skunk is considered to be a Wampanoag delicacy. How you catch a skunk? Very carefully, right? <laughs> you get two boys. One boy would be in front of the skunk, distracting him. Hey, skunky, right? You get the other boy, they'll sneak upon him from behind, grab his tail, and lift him, up, lift him off the ground. In order for a skunk to spray, he has to be on his all fours, putting pressure on his hind legs to release those stink glands. You get up in the air, he can't do that. You have a club, you bang him over the head, and you very carefully cut him open and take his stink glands out. I say carefully because he punctured those stink glands. Yeah, you might not be welcome in the community for a while. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard recently, though, I haven't tried it, but some elders say you take that gland of the skunk and you break it open and you rub it on, on your arthritis. And it's, it, really, it works. <laughs> I don't have arthritis yet, so I, I so. They don't sell it in drugstores yet either, so. And what we do a lot in the winter is a lot of the women do a lot of the weaving, okay? Now, we're known for our weaving, the Wampanoag people. Some of our weavers are the best in the world, and some of their work is at the Smithsonian down in Washington, D.C. There, there's a woman named of Comey Wild Horse Haynes, who's a relative of mine, she's Wampanoag, and her work's in the Smithsonian down in D.C. Now, how do we make string? A lot of people say, oh, you guys had string? Yeah, we had string. We made string. How do we make string? We use different plants. We use milkweed. We use dog bane. We use the inner bark of a basswood tree. We take those stalks. After they're dead, we pull them out of the ground. We open it up. We take the inner fibers out. Then we work them together on our leg. When the colonists got here in 1620, they noticed whomping on women making strings so fast that their eyes couldn't keep up with. And then we dye it with different types of berries and roots for the coloring. So we had small bags like you see here. And we also had large bushel bags to store our dried vegetables so we'd have food during the winter. Now this right here is the interior of a house. <laughs> that, those are actually all my daughters right there. Those are three out of my four. 
I got four daughters and no boys. Yeah. <laughs> so my, that's the oldest daughter sitting down, name's Talia. The two sit, sitting on the ground, uh, Cash, Emma, and Storm. I want to break out for a second. I want to tell you where this, these pictures are coming from. We worked with Scholastic quite a bit over the years. And in 2016, they came to Plymouth Plantation and said, can we make a video and put, and put this video across every third grade class going across the United States? Yeah, we should have said, sure. <laughs> so we set up the script, and Richard and I worked on it quite a bit. He did the colonial side, I did the Wampanoag side. And we showed how Wampanoag and colonial kids lived back then, you know, back in the 17th century and before. But then again, it leads up to what they do today. It shows, it shows Tashma and Storm riding their bikes, playing in the play, playground, wearing clothes like she has, has on today. And that's what kids relate to. They think we're gone. Just because we wear different clothing today, at times, we're still here. And I do a lot of teaching, right? And this video is, literally is across every third grade class in the United States. And sometimes when I walk in these third grade classes, they're playing the video. It's called the Wampanoag Way. You can Google it, right? So I played a father in it. So I'm dressed up in 17th century skins. And when, I walk, when I'm walking in one classroom, right, I see a boy watching the video on the screen. He sees me walking in. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, Storm's dad. <laughs> oh, yeah, I am. So it's a surreal moment. So inside these houses, right, we have bedding. We don't sleep on the ground. We have furs on the beds. We have mats on the beds. Like I said, the houses got really big, round shaped. They get really warm, too. Our houses get 60, 70 degrees. Rule of thumb when you're making these houses, I do, I do quite a bit of these houses myself. I build them. Every 10 feet or so, you want to have a fire pit on the inside. And that's just to keep you warm during the winter. It is a round shape. You can't really see on the walls. But we have bulrush mats on the walls, which you have bark, interior frame. Then you have your mats, two layers of bulrush mats. You got that one foot gap, right? And because of the way the house is shaped, like a dome shaped, the heat's going to rise, go up, go down underneath the mats, force the cold air out to the middle. And that keeps the warm air going around in circles. When the Europeans got here and they went inside our houses, they said the houses were so warm during the winter that they saw native children running outside naked during the winter and jumping into the snow. So they get quite warm. So we lived like, this, like that for thousands of years, guys, right? We went through that cycle. Following spring, we celebrate New Year's again. We come out near the ocean. We come out in our family groups alone because we needed space for planting. No need for the winter. Why not gather back together and we be more communal? And a winter community during the winter can hold anywhere from 300 to, say, 3,000 people before disease hit. Now, that was before any major interruption, all right? That's a 13 moon cycle real quick. That was, let's call that 16, 13, all right? And one thing I want to say real quick is, you hear the term law for survival for Native people. How'd you guys survive back then? Well, we've been doing this for 12,000 years, <laughs> OK? You just don't roll over in bed in one morning. Oh, geez, where am I going to get food today? You know, there's a system already set up generations long before that people knew how to, knew how to fish, so. So like you said, like we call that 1613, okay? Let's move to 1614. There was trading going on, you know. First European traders out here, was recorded was back in 1524 with Varasano. The trade started blooming in the early 1600s. You heard some names, Giles, Nolan, and such. Back in 1614, though, the guys, when trading happened, what English wanted in French and Dutch was a lot of otter pelts, a lot of beaver pelts, and what they made their hats of Europe out of. <clears throat> but what happened in 1614, there was an English captain named Thomas Hunt. He came down the coast. Remember the state, 1614, okay? He came down the coast, and he went to an area which is called Plymouth today, in what we call Patuxet, okay? That was a thriving Wampanoag community, probably over 1,000 people. And that's how you describe yourself back then, guys. If you're traveling to Patuxet, and you went up to somebody and say, hey, what are you? 
You know, they won't, probably wouldn't say Wampanoag because they expect you to know, to know this is Wampanoag country. They would describe themselves from what Wampanoag speaking community they're from. So they say, I'm a Patuxet, what are you? Okay? But when Thomas Hunt came to Patuxet, he took 19 Patuxet as slaves. A lot of people think African American, think of slavery. This happened to our people too. This is six years before the pilgrims arrived here, okay? Took 19 Patuxet, went down Cape, stopped in what is East Ham, what we call Nosset as Wampanoag people, and took eight Nosset. Brought them to Spain, sold some there, the remainder were sold to England. And one of those guys who was sold to England, his name was um, Squanto. That sound familiar? You guys heard of Squanto? He lived over England with a merchant named John Slaney. Okay? He lived there for five years. And from what I hear, he gained some kind of status. He learned a lot about English culture. He knew how to speak English fluently over those five years. Okay? Um, but what happened to Squanto, there was a wealthy man named Fernando Gorges over there who was funding a lot of these trips. And they were asking, who's from this area, what's called Plymouth Tay Patuxet? They said Squanto is. Well, where is he? He's up in Newfoundland with um, Captain Mason. So they said, well, go get him. I want to do another adventure, right? So he sends Thomas Dermer to pick up Squanto. Mind you, this is 1619, going over five years, right? So he hasn't seen his home since 1614. He's picked up in Newfoundland, 1619, by Thomas Dermer. He comes down the coast, they come down the coast, stop in Mohegan Island, which is off Maine, pick up Samoset, who's considered to be a Sagamore, a chief in his own language. Samoset knew how to speak English, knew a lot of the English captains back then, okay, by name. So he dealt a lot of traders prior. They kept on going down the coast, but when they were going down the coast, guys, in 1619, they saw something extremely devastating. The most devastating thing that ever happened to our people, disease. There was a major epidemic that happened between 1616 and 1618 or 19, right? When Squanto was over England. This plague, skin turned yellow, people got open sores on their bodies, and they died within two or three days once they got this. But it wiped out the native population all along the coast anywhere from 70 to 90 percent were wiped out within two or three years, okay? Now that plague, as far as we know, didn't affect a lot of people on the islands, like Nantucket Vineyard, because it's hard for disease to go over water. That's why a lot of the people out here were protected from that plague. And some people also probably moved out here for protection of the plague. But when, what we know about the plague, right? The common thought over the years, okay, hepatitis, skin turning yellow, open sores. Disease control came out something over 10 years ago. They believed it might be leptospirosis. And what that is, they believe it's from the French trade ships coming over, and they had rats on these trade ships, and the fetus of the rats get into the water system, causing an infectious liver disease. And that's what the theory is now. I always, say, I always say this every time I talk, you can put whatever name you want on it. It doesn't matter to me. What I do know it was the most devastating thing that ever happened to our people, period. So as Dermer's coming down the coast with Squanto and Samoset, they come to Patuxet. And they find out Patuxet was pretty much devastated. So imagine that, right? Squanto taken as a slave in 1614, coming back home, he finds out all his people are dead. Is that gonna change you as a person? I think so. They end up going over to the vineyard, right? And there was a leader over the vineyard named Epinal. Now, Epinal was taken also captive as a slave in 1611 over to England. He made it back, though. How he made it back was in 1614, Gorgeous was asking him, too, hey, is it gold around where you're at? Is it gold on the island you come from? Epinal was a chief. He wasn't dumb. Epinal was probably thinking, yeah, this is gold. <laughs> you bring me back home, I'll tell you where the gold's at. So in 1614, they brought him back home. And that's when he yelled out something in a native tongue which the English did not understand. A lot of his men came running to the beach. The following day, they attacked the ship, and he had a chance to jump over and swim to shore. So he made it home, OK? But so he sees Dermer coming in, in another ship coming in in 1619. So he's home for five years. So what he's going to think, oh, geez, these people might be attacked, coming to get me again. So there's another fight that breaks out. Dermer gets injured quite 
badly. Squano and um, Samuset are somehow released. We don't know how, but they got loose. And they end up in Massasoit's community of Poconoke. A lot of people think Massasoit, the great Wampanoag leader. Like I said, there were 70 Wampanoag communities, right? And what we know for sure, Massasoit was a leader of the biggest and strongest Wampanoag community called Poconoke, located in what is called Bristol, Warren, Rhode Island today, okay? So Samuset and Squano end up there. Okay, let's fast track to 1620. Pilgrims arriving. So they arrive, arrive in what is called, well, they finally settle in Plymouth, what is Plymouth today, December 1620. They had a really bad year that winter. A lot of people died. From what I hear, the February was the deadliest month. But they were building their home, staying on the Mayflower. They settled there because it was good water. It was cleared out already. So, um, Massasoit being two days walk away, 40 miles west of Plymouth, Poconoke, what is Bristol, Rhode Island today, he heard about these people building homes. See, one thing we were used to, we were always used to people coming over, coming, Europeans coming over here. The only thing we weren't used to is people coming over and staying. Okay, that was different. So, but what made, what made these people different is they brought their women and children. And that might have meant a friendly type of people. But still, Massasoit didn't know, you know. So he, he probably calls over Sam and said, hey, Sam and said, come here. You know how to speak English, right? Of course, Sam said, yeah. Why don't you go into these people, right? Go into Patuxent and find out why these people are building their homes. Masai, like I say, was a leader. He was a sachem. He wasn't, he wasn't dumb. He was probably thinking, well, this guy's considered to be a Sagamore chief too, but he can speak English. And also, he's not one of my men. <laughs> so I don't know what's going to happen to him. So come March 16, March 16, 21, Samuset walks into the Pilgrim Village. I think March, yeah, March 16, they considered him to be naked. He didn't have this much clothing on what you see this guy has on right now. He had on just a breechcloth. And he goes in and he goes, welcome Englishmen in their own language, which they were shocked at seeing, seeing a native person speak English to him, okay? He told them about the land, told them about the area, told them about the plague that just came through. He actually stays in Stephen Hopkins' house that evening which is kind of, in my, kind of different, you know? But they carefully washed him overnight. He goes, you know what? I'm not from here. I'm gonna bring you a leader who is. So he goes back and tells Massasoit it was all right to come along. Later on that in March, Massasoit comes along and brings 60 of his men. And that's when they make that famous treaty between the two people, that peace treaty, treaty of diplomacy. One needed each other, okay, at the time. You think about it, I mentioned that plague coming down the coast. That plague stopped dead in his tracks right before Narragansett people started, territory. Any, any thoughts about that, why it stopped right there? We have two good thoughts, right? Narragansett and Wampanoag did not like each other for at least two or three generations before there was any European contact here, okay? And down there, you got that large body of water called Narragansett Bay. And like I said, disease is hard to go over water. But then again, the Narragansett scene, the Wampanoag were depleted in numbers. One of the leaders, Canonicus, probably was thinking, oh, I'll start to attack. And Massasoit's community was located right on the border of the Narragansetts. So the, before a Narragansett chief came out and made an alliance with the colonists, Massasoit did. So, protect, so one needed each other because how you really felt for the English staying here, it wasn't one universal answer. You have to go from community to community. If your brother got taken as a slave by traders prior, are you gonna be happy? No, and there were leaders who weren't happy. But Massasoit had a lot of power, you know? Um, so basically, it's the seven pieces of the treaty, but basically they say, if you go to war, I'll help you out, and if I go to war, you help me out, so. And we know that treaty lasted over 50, well, for 55 years with no major, major conflict of war, okay? Later on in 1621, that's when Squanto comes to live, stay with uh, the colonist, and he teaches them how to plant corn. That's what he's famous for, right? Teach them how to plant corn. That's what he's in the textbooks about. Like I said, Squanto was a changed person. He liked having power. He caused a lot of trouble back then. He died in 1622, but with that two years, he caused a lot of drama. He would go to Massoy and say, oh, you better watch out. Bradford wants to attack. To attack. They run back to Bradford and say the same thing, back and forth, back and forth. 
So Masoi was fed up, says, I want, you know, he actually sent his men out to Plymouth with his own personal knife and wanted Squanto's head and hands delivered back to him. Okay? Governor Bradford's thinking, hmm, I should do this because this, this could be one of the first breaks of the treaty because the states, if one does something wrong to another, you have to turn that person over. But oh, all of a sudden, actually, Massoy comes out with gifts too, by the way, to give <laughs> Governor Bradford Squanto's head and hands with his own personal knife. But at the same time, there was a ship that, come, that was coming in the water, and Bradford said Governor Bradford was distracted. And he went, goes, wait a second. So the guys got frustrated and went, went back home. Like I said, Squano dies in 1622. I think he leaves Stephen Hopkins and a few others down to Chatham, what we call Manamoyak, for a trading scenario, meet and greet, whatever. And that evening when he, when he was in the house, one of the houses, they said Squano had a nosebleed that wouldn't stop. It was something what they called Indian fever back then. It was some type of hemorrhaging going on. But when he was lying on his deathbed, he asked the English if he would be accepted into their gods. Although he might have been a changed person, he knew what he was doing. Um, this guy right here doesn't get much praise in the textbooks. He, um, <laughs> Habermach, if it wasn't because of this guy, history would, would, would have definitely been different today. Massoy, he made that treaty with the English in 1621. He needed somebody out, because this village was 40 miles west. He needed an ambassadorship out here. And, well, well, not out here, but out in Plymouth Colony. And that's when he sent Hopmock to live amongst the English. He lived actually in between Stephen Hopkins, I think Howland's Fields, with his family of over 10 people for anywhere from 10, 15 years of his life, okay? He was the closest friend the English, were, the closest native the English were considered to be a friend. They don't say much about his family. They say Hopmock has more than one wife. I wish I knew one of his wife's name because she plays a major role in the diplomacy. She actually reports back and forth to Massasoit and what's going on, especially with Squanto, but they never give her a name. Um, they don't say much about his family structure, and we're guessing he lived in a home, a bark covered house like normal, what he was used to. But like I said, he kept peace between the two people. He was considered to be a panice, and a panice is one who counsels on war and one who leads in the battle. And a lot of time, by English standards, they were considered to be indestructible. Now, how do you become a panisse? You're chosen from childhood. You have special qualities. Special people choose you. And from then on, you're raised. One of the final stages to be a panisse, you'd be given a stone knife. You would go into the woods alone for a whole winter. If you came back, you would be a panisse. If you didn't, you wouldn't. <laughs> but yeah, he was highly respected amongst the people. Um, he kept other people, native people who didn't like, were colonists, and, and, and you know, to know, so. He's a key role player. Let's skip up a little bit here, praying towns. This right here, if you've ever been on the homeland, well, my homeland, being Mashpee, this is the oldest meeting house in, Mass in the United States. It's, it was built in 1684. We heard a little bit about praying towns. We know a lot of it started over Martha's Vineyard with Mayhew. We know what is called Town today. There was Hayakums there and learning about the King James Bible. And they say Hayakums, he was one of my relatives, knew the Bible so well that I was preaching it to non-native people. But not, not everybody liked what he was doing either. There was a chief in Chappaquiddick who called him out, said, come here Hayakums. He goes, what are you doing? We have our own ways of doing things. Why are you teaching something different? And literally punched him in the face. Um, but he continued to preach. He actually made it over here. You heard in Nantucket. Um, we'll talk about his son soon, Joel, what he did. So, and we know Natick, of course, was the first praying town in 1651. Um, there was about 14 of them. You had the Mayhews, you had the Cottonwoods, you had John Elliott's. Um, do I have that, what I'm looking for here? Okay, I want to talk about this right here. This is the son right here, guys, Joel Iacombs, Iacombs the son. Back in, back in the Natick area, when Praying Town was being formed first, John Elliott was a missionary up there, right? He was teaching Native people. Joel was one of them. Caleb was another. You might have heard of the book, Caleb's Crossing. Um, and these two guys would have been the first graduating class of Harvard University back in 1665. 
One graduated, Caleb did. Joel did not. Okay? Jo Joel was considered valedictorian. The reason he did not graduate is two weeks before graduation, he went home to Martha's Vineyard. On the way back, stopped here in Nantucket. And he got killed. And it was probably his own people did it. Because Christianity didn't make it over here to what, the Mayhew in 59, a little later. So you had a lot of traditionalists still here, basically asking what I was doing. I always say about the praying Indians, you don't know what they were going through unless you walk a mile in their moccasins. Okay? So I never judge like that. But what Harvard did back in 2011, they invited my family up there and gave us a posthumous degree in his name, which Harvard rarely does. And this is it right here. When, and also, when Elliot was teaching the Bible to Native people back in the 50s and 60s, he felt like the Native people were not picking the, language, picking the religion up quick enough, being the Bible, King James Bible written in English. So what he did, he hired Native interpreters and wrote the Bible in Wampanoag, and in my language. I say that because it's a good story, a really good story, right? Have you heard, I'm sure most, many, some of you guys might have heard about language. Back in the 1990s, there was a woman from my community. She's our vice chair today, right? Her name's Jessie Little Doe Beard. And she was having dreams. This is a true story, having dreams. She said people were coming into a dream speaking a different tongue. This happened night after night after night. She said that people looked familiar from Mashpee, but did not know their names. One of her dreams, the people came and spoke English to her. They said if the Wampanoag people had the chance to get the language back, would they say yes? So she took it upon herself, went to MIT, graduated with a degree in linguistics, and started piecing the language back together again. How this was done, elders who still could speak some of the language. Um, old records written in Wampanoag, okay? Similar language families. But what helped the, well, the great, a great deal was that Bible the King James Bible written in Wampanoag. And we have one of those first editions in our grasp today. So today we have our language back. My wife is one of the teachers of the language. We have a monastery school. We teach pre-K up to third grade, and every year we add on a grade to it. Going back three years ago, maybe two, the Wampanoag is, is taught, still right now, in Mashpee High School. It's taught as a credited course, like English, French, and Dutch, Portuguese. So other we open up to other students. And that's a real cool story, because if you lose your culture, you lose part of what you are. That's your identity, and we got it back. Let's fast forward to war. Nobody likes war, but war broke out. What I can tell you, in 1670, what? No, 1657 and 1660, that's when the two of the first big leaders lost their lives. We know Governor Bradford lost in 57, passed away. We know Mass Slate lost in 1660. So you got the next generation coming up, which didn't care for each other a whole lot. Why? The thought of land. One people thought of ownership, and the other people did not think of ownership. So one culture would build fences around where they lived. The other culture would walk across what they would call their backyard. You can't be here no more. This is not yours anymore. And I say the culture, that's my culture. For a native person, they're thinking, what do you mean I can't be here no more? I don't get that. Because land is part of what you are as a person. Other cultures have different way of thought. That was the reasons, you know. And in 1675, the King Philip War broke, broke out. In June, it was the bloodiest war per capita in, in New England. It lasted around Massachusetts about a year or so. A little farther, a couple more years farther north. King Philip was, was Massachusetts' second son. His name, original name, was Metacomet. <laughs> now, that, that guy was something to reckon with. He actually heard about, oh, on Nantucket, right, a native person talking bad about him. He took his canoe and paddled out here to confront this person. He also asked a lot of people of the islands to join into the war. You know, I, I believe they saved by themselves, but that war lasted about a year. It ended up um, with Benjamin Church, led by a native guide, finding Metacomet, King Philip. August 12th, 1676, at his home, what was called Mount Hope, Poconokit. And when they found him, they dismantled him. They took his head off. They took his arm, limb by limb, and threw it around. 
and t took his head back to Plymouth to put on the post for 20 years. And they were thinking, what are we going to do with his wife and his kid, you know? They didn't think death was right. So what happened, a lot of these people sold to, as slaves. There's no good strike in slavery. I don't think, I can't, I can't think close is what's going on today. A lot of these people sold down to Bermuda, one of the islands down there. And those people over those hundreds of years still have their cultural identity. They know who they are. So we as Wampanoag people go down and visit them one year, and they come up and come to their powwow in Mashpee, which is going close on to 100 years ago. July 4th weekend, if you're not around, if you're around, come see us. We did were just up here this few weeks ago, so it's kind of cool. Um, let's go a little forward to what happened here. Now, there's a large population. I heard 400 or so people over here in Nantucket. There was a vaccine given to Native people in 1763, 1764, that wiped out two thirds of the population of people, you know. You heard Gene O'Brien's story a little bit earlier, and that's true, you know. Like, what happened to these people afterwards? A lot, a lot of people maybe say isolated by themselves. After that, a lot of people might have took off to Mashpee or Martha's Vineyard, so people were spread out. You hear a lot about the last Indians and all that. It's that you look at it, that's a, one, from a person's lens, personal lens, you know. If, he, if it wasn't, a lot of people say, if it's if not recorded, it's not true. It's not written down, that's not, that's not true, so. Um, so that happened. Let's go forward a little about 1830 Indian Removal Act. You guys heard of President Jackson? Yeah, it's 1830, he wanted to remove all Native people on the East Coast, which he did, west of the Mississippi. Oklahoma was one of the states, relocation. The reason I bring this up is, those agents came around here too, from Wampanoag people. Those agents wanted us, us out west of Oklahoma. And there's one non-native voice that stood up, his name being John Quincy Adams. And he said, if you bring these people out west, they're gonna die. The reason they're gonna die is because they rely on seafood on their diet. And they believed them. And that's why we were left alone. Abram Query, Dorcas Honorable, last two, they say Indians of Nantucket, um, who knows? That was like I said for people's lens, some people's lenses. Um, they died within what, seven months apart, seven, seven weeks. Um, what else do we got here? This is kind of cool right here. We might be doing this next year out here. Seriously, we just got a we just got a um, forty foot log, Richard. I don't know if you know. Coming, in, I'm looking at it next week. With a forty foot white pine log, which we're going to make a twenty man boat. It's going to be considered to be the largest boat in New England. Okay. This picture is from um, a paddle we made in 2002 to Martha's Vineyard. We landed over Tisbury, a place called Tashmu. Tashmu. Um, now, back in the 90s, right, like I said, I've been at the museum quite a while, we always say, okay, we used to make paddles to Nantucket, we used to make paddles to the vineyard. I mean, everything was past tense, I'm like, why can't we do this again? So we had a 30-foot poplar tree donated, that's what this is, we made a machine out of. We also had a 20-foot of white pine we made a machine out of. The guy in the back, his name is Anawan Whedon, he's Narragansett and Wampanoag, and we all wanted to steer this boat, this big 30-foot boat, right? So Anna and I looked at each other, hey, let's race for it. So he took a, two 12-foot boats, he took one, I took another, machines, ashes, and went across the Eel River located on the Wampanoag home site and see if we make it back first. And those were, those were like speed boats going on. And he beat me by a half a boat length. <laughs> <laughs> so he got to steer the boat. Now this took, trip took a lot of planning, right? It took three years of planning. We finally made the trip, though. It involved a lot of nations of people, okay? It involved Megama, known as Micmac. It involved Pequot, Narragansett, Ponkapog, Wampanoag, of course, right? We left a place called, you guys heard of Woods Hole? <laughs> okay, we left Woods Hole August 18th of 2002. We left 6 a.m., we left the peak of high tide. We had 10 mile an hour winds to our back. We landed over Tashmu, Tisbury, 
If it was a straight shot, it would have been five miles. We had to get out of ferry lanes and made it to a seven mile paddle. Now I gave you the elements, tell me how long it took. Now I'll also tell you that most experienced paddles, including myself, were so saying three hours to do. Everybody's saying three hours, three hours. There was nobody living who, was, who could say, this is how long it's gonna take you. Any guesses in the crowd? Hour and a half, correct, absolutely correct, yeah. And what happened, right, when we made this trip, we kind of beat the ferry. We had a few hundred people saw us leave Nopska, okay? Nopska point down to Woods Hole. And those people had to take a shuttle to the ferry, take the ferry over to Vineyard Haven, and then take another uh, shuttle to Tashmu Beach. <laughs> and we had beaten them there by a half hour. <laughs> so they were telling us, oh, we're gonna have a big celebration, you know? We're gonna be out there dancing and singing when you guys arrive into the port. So we're excited, even a clam bake maybe, you know? <laughs> so I remember paddling in. That day when we left, it was really cloudy. We only saw each other's boats. And when we come to the Tashmo, the, all, the, all the fog broke. And I'm, pad I'm paddling in and I'm like, where's everybody? We weren't wearing watches, so we didn't know how long it was, it was taking us, right? And we saw these people on the beach on bathing suits, right? Those eight sunbathers from Nebraska there. <laughs> So once we landed, because we were dressed in 17th century skins, you know, the first thing out of their mouths is they're like, you guys do this every day? I go, this hasn't been done in a couple hundred years. But like I said, we got this, and we got this 40 foot boat, boat we're gonna be making. We got a lot of things we wanna do, it next, do it with the next year. And one thing is pot have Nantucket involved. And we have some ideas, so stay tuned. Um, Leaping up to 1870 here, that's when a lot of communities got incorporated. Mine being one, Mashpee, and a Quinter, a few others. And what that meant for our people is, okay, now it's considered to be a township, so what's happened? We're gonna give you 25 acres of your own land, but now we're gonna tax you on it. And, yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> so that, that word incorporation means a different term in my, my language. My, so, we lost a lot of our land like that. Fast forward through the 1900s, on, um, Cape Cod became Cape Cod, tourist attraction. Where I live, Mashpee, nobody really moved to Mashpee, not until um, probably the 90s. And Mashpee was the fastest developing town in, in, in um, Massachusetts in the 90s. And today, let me go back, today we have our we literally just got fully recognized by the U.S. government back in 2007 as a people, okay? And what we do today, we have health services, we have programs for housing, health, education. We do our powwow, um, which is July 4th weekend. This, is, uh, right, this right here is a special dance. We did this past powwow. This is my, a lot of my family. Hey, we did it for my brother who passed away back in 97, he got killed down in Rhode Island. His name was Mel Melvin Coombs, and we danced for him. But this isn't an, an order, but I want to show you something, which I, I, visit here, I haven't visited here in, I don't know, eight or 10 years. But um, I had Tash, my, my daughter, and myself, we went out to um, the, the cemetery up the road where my family's buried, a lot of my family. My father was raised here. My aunt was raised here. My grandparents were raised here. Um, my grandfather was Darius Coombs the second. His, the first being um, Darius Coombs the first from Mashpee. So Darius Coombs moved, to set, my grandfather moved to here from Mashpee. You got one, Darius was born 1886. You got my grandmother Ruth West, born in 1895, passed away in 1964. And she had a stillborn son, um, 1919. So I, I, very, I visited, visited grounds yesterday, right? And I was, I Googled Indians of Nantucket. <laughs> and I came across a picture that I have in my living room. This is my grandmother. <laughs> and, I, and you guys, the, the Nantucket Historical Society has it right here. You know, I'm like, and there wasn't a name underneath it. I'm like, that's, that's Ruth West, that's my grandmother. She passed away in, um, like I said, 1964. But yeah, I'm gonna do dig more digging to 
see where her actual roots are from. Because this is one woman I've heard from McQuinner. I heard it's not Mashpee. She doesn't show up at the records in Mashpee. I can't find her in the records in McQuinner. So I'm going to start to keep on digging, see what I find. Thank you, guys. Any questions, though? That's my, that's my story, guys. Mm -hmm.